Okay, good morning everyone. Good morning to the students online as well. I hope you're doing well. Okay, so let's do, do a quick review what, what we did last week, right? So last week we looked at uh, sharing the gospel in five minutes. We looked at sharing the gospel in two minutes. We looked at the four spiritual laws and uh, and so it's very important that we use these guidelines, right? They're just guidelines for us to share the gospel, right? Now, uh, doesn't mean that, you know, I have to use it this way. I have to say from Genesis to Revelations, or I have to give the salvation experience. You see what works for you, and you share the gospel, right? So we looked at um, experience, what was your need before, and how the Lord met your need. And then we looked at, very importantly, the work of the Holy Spirit while ministering the gospel. Now we must understand that it's not our work, right? Is it our work? Is it our work to speak into people's hearts? Yes or no? Our work is to share the gospel. And the gospel, the power of God, the Holy Spirit, will speak into people's lives, right? So that's very important. Uh, we must understand that. And especially when we're sharing, teaching, preaching, everything must be anointed from the Holy Spirit. Right? Oh, I was teaching the other class. We were talking about why the anointing is important, right? We can do many things in, in ministry. Right, but if it's not anointed of God, it's not going to touch people's lives. Yes, right, because the anointing of God, the Holy Spirit's anointing, will only touch and change people's lives. We can preach, we can lead worship, we can do everything out of the flesh, also. And if there's no anointing of the Holy Spirit, it is not going to touch people's lives. It'll only go here. It won't go here. Right? So whatever we are doing in ministry, right, it should be anointed of God. Right? So that should be our prayer. Right? God, I'm leading 10 minutes of worship now, or 20 minutes, you're sharing the word. You must pray that the word and the worship, Lord, you anoint it so that it will touch people's lives. And you can see the difference. Yes or no? Are you surprised? You're looking at me, you'll feel, uh, what is he talking about? You know, Holy Spirit, no. He's there inside you. Amen? Right? So everything that we do must be anointed of God. Right? So let's look at the next chapter. Next chapter, we're going to be talking about ministering the gospel in power and love. Everyone say power and love. Now, they are like oxymorons, no? meaning they are, they are, there's power, there's love. Power talks about authority and there's love. Now, Jesus ministered in power, but he also ministered in love. Now, we must develop this ability to do that. Is power important? Yes or no? Power is important. Why do we need the power of God? Students online, why do we need the power of God? To? To manifest His gifts, okay. Why do we need God's power? He convicts, okay. Why do we need the power of God? Can't we just, you know, just do ministry? Why do we need God's power? Sorry? To be an effective witness, what do you say? To impact others, okay. Who else? Why do you need, what is uh, power in Hindi? Shakti, yeah, Samarth. Why do you need that? Right? We must ask ourselves, why do I need the power of God? Is it simply because okay, God is saying I'm powerful, so I also want to be powerful? Why do you want the power of God? 
to bring down strongholds, okay? People believe what you say, okay? Jesus, uh, Apostle Paul says, my ministry was not only in word, but in demonstration and power. Right? There, was, there was a demonstration. Right? So Jesus ministered with power. When the Lord Jesus went about preaching and teaching, healing and delivering and working out miracles, he did it with power, but he combined it with compassion. Now, usually if you see a powerful man, very unlikely they are compassionate. Right? These powerful rich men and women that you may see around us, very unlikely that they are compassionate. You know, they are very authoritarian by nature. Right? Jesus had thousands of people following him. But what happened after that? He had the power, right? He was telling the blind people, hey, I'll make you see. He was healing people. He, he was just changing the course of events happening there. But he did all of this because of his love. He didn't do it because he wanted to become famous. He didn't do it because he wanted people to know, okay, that you know, uh, even though I'm a carpenter's son, I'm able to do these great things. He didn't do it just to show the Pharisees and Sadducees that, you know, I'm greater than you. I know more than you. He didn't do it for that. Jesus ministered in power and in love. Love of Christ, the love of God the Father, pushed him to do all of this. Now, this is very important for all of us. We all want to do a powerful ministry, right? We all want to do a good worship. We want to teach the word of God powerfully. We must remember that we must love the people that we are ministering to. It could be one person. It could be thousands of people. We've got to love them. We must be in a place to care for them by saying that, okay, these are people that need to hear the gospel. They need to understand Christ. They need to understand the word of God. And when you minister out of love, it's already power there. Right? So let's look at a few examples here. Um, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36. Any one of us can read Matthew 9 and verse 36. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36. And maybe... Someone else can take Matthew 14, 14 as well. When he saw the people, he was, what does it say there? Moved with compassion. You know, the Greek for moved was he was stirred up with compassion. Right? So Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the people. Jesus didn't say, okay, why have you come here again? How many times to tell you the same thing? Why do you keep following me? No. What does he say? He was moved with compassion. Why? Because there were people who were just there, lost, without a shepherd, without a leader. They don't know what they are doing. Many of them had sicknesses, diseases, failures in their life. He was moved with Compassion. Matthew fourteen fourteen. Read. Mm. Again, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion. Right. What is this that we must learn in this? Very simple point. When we are ministering to people, they may be people from other faiths. Right? It's very easy to bring condemnation. No, Hey, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is wrong. But Jesus here, he didn't say what you're doing is wrong. He was moved with the compassion. The love of God was the source of all that he did. 
Right? So it's very important for each one of us to be moved with compassion. Right? When we see people who are struggling, right, and, and we get this opportunity to minister to them, do it. Now, here's the thing, very important point. To be moved with compassion means does not mean you agree to everything what people say. Yes or no? What did Jesus say? Many places he rebuked the leaders. Yes? Did he rebuke the leaders? Yeah. But did he not love them? Or did he love them? He loved them. Right? So when we are ministering, we minister with compassion. Next one. We minister with the power of God. Let's read John 14. Now this is a big verse, but maybe one of us can read this, right? John 14, 1 to 13. John. So this is John 14, 1 to 13, right? 1 to 13. 13, read to 13. How does focus on that one verse, right? What does it say there? Greater things than I do, I did, you will do. Right? Now, in the Greek, when we look at it, Jesus is not talking about the essence of the miracle. Right? Uh, so I hope you're getting what I'm saying, right? Jesus is not talking about, when he says greater things, it's, it's not about the essence. Right now, Jesus walked on water. Doesn't mean we can say, okay, Jesus walked uh, greater things than you know he did. I will do. Go to the nearest swimming pool and try to walk on water. You'll need help. Right? You can't do it. Right? You can't take five loaves of bread and two fish and all of you divide it and eat. Yes or no? Or one plate of food and say, okay, all of us are gonna pray and. No, he's, he's talking about the essence. It's not the essence of the miracles, but greater in terms of volume, right? The apostle, oh, sorry, Jesus did his miracles for three and a half years. Jesus is saying, as believers, you will continue this ministry doing greater means volumes, much more than what I did. I did only for three and a half years, but you will do greater more 
right? So what Jesus did in three and a half years as believers, you will do much more than that. And is it true or no? Yes. All across the world, globally, when we see now, what's happening? Thousands and thousands and thousands of miracles. Now, how is that happening? That verse goes on later, because the power of God will be in you. Right? It's not happening on our own ability, but it's happening because of the power of God. So it's very important to remember the essence of that verse. Right? Greater works than what I did, you will do. So the greater in the Greek simply means bigger, more, right? in terms of volume. Are you getting what I'm saying? Right? Because there's many times this can be used and put into a wrong understanding. I've been saying, oh, greater works, no. So even I will do. Even I will try to turn water into wine, or I will also try to feed people, or I'll also try to go and do something. No. Yes, God may call us to do supernatural works, but we have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Right? See, the Lord Jesus, he, he was tempted. He came back after he was tempted. He was led by the Holy Spirit. In every way. Right? So when he went to the wedding at Cana, he was led. First, what did he say? What did Jesus say? My time has not yet come. But the next verse, what does he say? Go fill the water pots. What happened there? Moment. The Holy Spirit would have told him, start. Now is the time. You launch your ministry. But before that, he said, now is not my time. So you see that the Lord Jesus was being led by the Holy Spirit. So there will be times you will be led by God to say things, to do things, right? You do it boldly, right? But remember, we are to minister in power and love, right? Let's look at the next example. Luke 24, 46 to 49. Anybody can read. Luke 24. 46 to 49. Mm. This is interesting, no? See, let me give you a context what's happening here, right? Jesus is resurrected. He's come and he's meeting his believers. Even in the book of John, it says, no? He sees the disciples. What does he say? He blows on them the Holy Spirit. Uh, can we find that verse? Yeah, John twenty twenty two. Somebody read that. Mm. Okay, now Jesus is resurrected. He's meeting with the disciples. John twenty twenty two. He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So they received the Holy Spirit. But what does he say after that? Go and tarry, which means go and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Now, what's the difference here? Jesus already blew, no, the Holy Spirit. Why is he saying go and wait? Then it happened in Acts, right? The day of Pentecost. Why, why were they waiting? He already blew on them the Holy Spirit. It says there that when you receive the Holy Spirit, when you wait and receive, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? You see, let's read that verse again. John, uh, sorry, Luke 24. I think it's verse 49. Hmm. Hmm. 
endured with power. So what is Jesus trying to say? You and I cannot think about doing ministry without the power of God. Yes? See, Jesus blew on the whole on the disciples. Then he said, go and wait. Don't try to do anything on your own. Go and wait and pray. Then what happened? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Let's read. Acts 1, 8. We all know this verse. Acts 1, 8. Amen. Right? So now, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, 120 people are praying. Where are the thousands of people? Nobody knows. 120 people are praying, God, send your Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes. We know the story, right? On Pentecost. And what happened? They received the power to be a witness. You know the Greek word for witness? It means martyr. What is martyr in Hindi to help the students in Hindi? Uh, what is martyr? Anybody knows the meaning of martyr? Uh, martyr means somebody who's willing to die for Jesus, like Apostle Paul. Right? All the disciples, those who are killed for the sake of Jesus, are called martyrs. Did you understand? Right? In Hindi, did you understand? Right? So those who are killed for the sake of the gospel are called Martyrs. So the Greek there is, you will receive power to be a martyr for Christ. Now Jesus knows that we cannot do ministry without the power of the Holy Spirit. What is the best example? Where was Peter when Jesus was crucified on the cross? Where was he? Crying somewhere? Where was he? He was not there, no. Was he at the cross? Oh, Jesus. No. He was not there. He denied Jesus. Forget about at least not being there. He denied Jesus. He said, no, no I don't know this person. Okay. Why? Out of fear, obviously. Right? He saw what's happening to Jesus. They were beating him. He was scourged. And the People are saying, hey, you're Jesus' disciples. Then they may catch him and beat him also. So he said, I don't know. Right? What was there? Fear. Now, a couple of days later, Peter is standing in front of everyone and saying, okay, everybody listen to me. This is what happened. Right? You, there was a man named Jesus. He came, he lived here, he did wonderful works among you. He was anointed of God. He preached the full gospel there. But you crucified him, you put him on the cross. Now, by God's power, he's raised again from the dead. He's alive now and he's given us the Holy Spirit. And through this Holy Spirit, we are called to live a holy life. Where is that fear gone? Have you thought of it? Where's that fear? Just. Maybe one month back he was afraid. Where's the fear gone? There was no fear. And the Bible says, when you read in the book of Acts, they saw that these two were unschooled, but they had the power of God. They could not do anything to, to them. Later on, they arrested Peter. What, did, what happened? What did Peter say for that? Was Peter fearful? Did he say, oh no, please don't arrest me. I will not preach. No. He, he said, okay. It didn't matter to him. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has empowered him. Now, you and I must understand that we need the power of the Holy Spirit to minister to people. We can't do it on our own. The legs will be shaking. If you try to do it on your own, especially in a time like we are living in now, with all the things that are happening around, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot go and minister to people on your own ability. You cannot do it. 
Jesus is telling the disciples here, even though I was with you for three and a half years, you saw all of it, all the miracles, you walked with me, yet you still need the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How much more you and I need it? Do we need it or no? Whether we are called to start a ministry, whether we are called to be in the workplace, we are called to be a witness, but we cannot do it on our own ability. We will fail. Yes, I'm not discouraging you, but what I'm saying is you need the Holy Spirit. Right? For everything, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? And this is the best example. Peter is the best example. They were all fearful. They were all running away. Next thing you know, Peter's bold and he's standing there, unafraid. He didn't say, oh, my wife is at home. Can you choose somebody else? John is not married, you choose him. No. He said, hey, doesn't matter. The, the blind, the lame man was there. Peter and John goes to the temple. The lame man is begging there. They would have gone through that steps hundreds and thousands of times. Yes or no? The steps to the temple. But they saw that lame man there. He's asking for money. What does Peter do? He says, hey, listen, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have, I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Now tell me, the same Peter, hundreds of times he's walked through that temple. He's not done it. But when the power of God is in our life, nothing can stop us. But we must also learn, we'll learn in the next chapters how to walk in wisdom, right? Just because we have power, it shouldn't be like we do whatever we feel like. You know, walk in wisdom, right? We'll talk about that later. Okay, Acts 5.32. Let's read. Acts 5.32, right? Sorry, can you read that again? Mm. Mm. I bet. Thank you. And we are witnesses, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given. Right? Now, Peter and John, you know, after they are uh, arrested, the angel comes and they are loosed from their chains. They walk out of prison. And they testify this. And then later on, also in the book of Acts, there's so many testimonies. Right? Picture this. Paul is in the island of Malta. He's, he's trying to put the you know, fire together. A snake gets caught in his hand. He shakes off that snake. He's preaching the gospel. Everyone are falling asleep. Teaching, teaching the whole night. He's not stopping. It was not a one hour session. It was not being recorded. Right? But he's teaching, teaching, teaching. The young boy is sitting near the window. I don't know why he chose the window, but he chose the window. He's sitting there. He fell asleep. He fell off and he died. What did Paul do? Let's start 21 days fasting prayer. What did Paul do? Don't worry. Pray, raise them up. Right? So they were, they were able to testify of God's power. Right? Nowhere was it in a way that okay, it was only talk. No. They were able to testify. And so here we see that when we walk in the power of God, we'll be able to testify of his power. And we had testimony time, right? All of us shared our testimony. We may not have had this big testimony, oh, you know, suddenly angel came and said something and went. We may not have those kind of testimonies, but even the smallest testimony is, is a testimony of God's power in our life. Yes? Right? Because the enemy has so many ways to distract us. The very fact that he has called us into his kingdom to be his children is the power of God. 
It's God's work in our lives, right? Next one, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Hebrews 2, 3 and 4. Amen. God testified it with signs, miracles, and wonders. What does it go say after that? Uh, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Signs, everyone say the signs, miracles, wonders, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Why do you have supernatural love every day? Time pass. What? I hope it's not time pass. <laughs> Why do you have supernatural love every day? Because? Come on. Why do you have supernatural love every day? I think we should tell you why you have supernatural love. <laughs> Students, why do you, online students, why do you pray and ask God for, you know, you pray and read the word every day? Why do you take all that effort? Why do you have supernatural hour every day? Because it's called supernatural hour. Okay, so what happens with the supernatural hour? There should be you know, the work of the Holy Spirit. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not only that Okay, I want to flow in all the gifts. That's good, right? Uh, but we want to see ourselves growing closer to God. There should be a, a sense of, okay, God, I, I, want to, I, I want to go closer to you. right? I, I want to know the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit begins to work in our lives through signs, miracles, and wonders. Now, some of us may say, how come I've been praying for so many years? I don't see signs. I don't see miracles. I don't see anything in my life. Right? I don't see, uh, you know, I'm not speaking in tongues. I don't know the prophetic. I don't know word of knowledge. I, I, I'm not flowing in these gifts. But it's been two, three years that I am, you know, praying for it. I want to encourage you. Don't give up. Right? Continue to pray. Because this is not a man-made effort right, of receiving the gift. God gives it to us. The Holy Spirit inside us, He gives it to us. Right? But we must desire it. Everyone say desire. Right? Like how you are desiring for this class to get over. Desire for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Right? And when you desire something, you're passionate about it, right? Or you desire for Friday. Friday comes or Saturday, Sunday. Leave. You don't feel that? You love very holy people. Sometimes, you know, I desired for Friday, Friday, Saturday. You know, when I was in Bible college, I would go and visit my parents. When you visit your parents after one week, you just have to sit. Everything will come to you. Food, snacks, everything. <laughs> well, because you're going after one week. So I used to desire for Friday. So Saturday morning, go visit my parents. So we desire so many things, no, in life. We, want, we desire to become a worship leader. We desire to preach. We desire to start a ministry. Same way, we must desire to flow in the supernatural. We must desire the gifts of the Spirit. And when we desire it, there will be signs, miracles, and wonders. Right? And here, it's the verse that we just read. God testifies it, testifies what we speak and preach with signs, wonders, and miracles. And that's what we want to achieve in the supernatural art as well, what you're doing, right? It should be a place where you begin to release the gifts of the Spirit, begin to pray in the Spirit, begin to uh, you know, flow in the gifts of the Spirit. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen, okay, because I said it, it's going to happen today. No. If it does, good. But remember that you can do it. Because God is saying here, I will testify it. 
I'll testify that the Holy Spirit is inside you with signs, miracles, and wonders. Now, the important point is to understand, do you have the Holy Spirit inside you? You sure? All of us are sure? And testify it with signs, miracles, and wonders. Let people see. Now, you're not doing it for a show, but when what is the meaning of testify? To show an outward appearance of it. We can't see the Holy Spirit, but we can see His working in and through us. Amen? Right? And so that's what we are called for. Expect miracles, signs and wonders wherever and whenever we minister. Right? You may be in a college. You may be in ministering it on the street. You may be in a friend's house. You may be visiting another friend, or somebody may have invited you to share on a topic which is, you know, maybe not even about the gospel, but be willing to minister. Be willing to see signs, wonders, and miracles. Right? And there are many instances where we used to go to colleges across Bangalore, we used to go and we used to have these one hour of, uh, you know, so worship, uh, word, and pray. But they used to say, don't say too much of Jesus, right? Because there's a lot of uh, people from other religions also. So don't say too much of Jesus. You can use God, but don't say too much of Jesus. So we agreed to it, but we would use Jesus every now and then. But we taught scriptures, right? And uh, many a times, right, it's so nice. It was so wonderful to see that there were times we were just teaching or just sharing something. And, you know, Many lives were touched. It's not about the preacher. It's not about the person who's teaching. But it's about God's word touching them and ministering to them. Right? This, I, in, in, we were in Mangalore for about four years, APC Mangalore. And I used to go to this college. Right? This, uh, and when, we, when I used to go to this college, we used to take scripture classes. Okay. And there was this boy here. It was for 11th and 12th, right? So they call it PUC, right? Yeah. There was this boy. He was very disruptive. Very, very disruptive guy, right? He would, when he come into class now, he would come, he would start walking there. He will start disturbing everyone. He'll start throwing chits on people. And he'll start, you know, poking fun. He'll look at his phone. Uh, he'll start yawning. He'll stretch himself. Very distracting guy. And he would disrupt the whole class. He would do something with the whole class. And I would be like, you know, I would have gone full prayer and all. I said, God, you have to touch their lives. But half the time it was this guy would disrupt the class. It would start from the beginning. Right? He would start the class with something. The whole class would be, you know, so like in their mood would have just changed. So I thought I used to pray. I said, God, this fellow is a troublemaker. Yeah? How do I get him out? I thought, let me chase him away from the class. Let me tell him, okay, out. But if I do that, how is he going to, how is he going to be ministered to? He'll happily go. Nothing for him. <laughs> but how will he be ministered to? I'm sure there's something about this fellow. So I kept praying every day. Every day the same problem. One day he's come with a bow and arrow. I don't know from where he gets these things. One day he'll come. Just very disruptive. Suddenly he would say, Sir, uh, I don't think I need God for now. You know, very disruptive guy. And one day uh, I was just praying. I said, God, I don't want the class to be disruptive because it's one fellow. Should I send him out of class? And I was, I was praying, and God just revealed something about me, him. It was nothing, it was not like the heavens opened and then. Uh, like a projector, something came and no. Just something in my spirit said, This is what is happening in his life. He needs help. I said, Okay. So I prepared myself and I went the next day. And I said, You know what? God gave me an idea also when I was praying. Make that fellow the class captain. So I said, You come here. You are the captain of this class. You like to trouble, no? You be the captain. So somewhere he was quiet. 
but then he still used to trouble. But then after the class one day, long story short, I called him, I sat with him and I told him, tell me something. The reason you're doing all this is because you're upset with God. He said, yes. Your sister committed suicide. He said, yes. And he started to cry. One month back, my sister committed suicide. He said, how do you know it? So because I told him because God told me. How did your sister commit suicide? Did she hang herself? She said, yes. He said, yes. So you're angry with God. You don't want anything to do with God because of this. And you want to just be, you, you have plans to just leave and you want to spoil your entire life because of this. Yeah. She is an innocent girl, good girl. But she committed suicide and I don't know why. And then I had to share. It took a lot of effort, a lot of time because I had to share with him what Jesus about Jesus. How can I say God loves you? I can't say God loves you. Don't worry. Sit quietly in class. I can't do that. There's a deep hurt inside him. And I began to talk to him every week, every week. I want all of them. In the end of that whole semester, he came forward and testified of what God did in his life. He was, he was a changed boy, completely changed. Right? And so we are not to, you know, look at people and eventually make the, you know, just say, okay, you are like this. Give God the time. Give God a way to minister in their lives. Trust in God to work miracles. Right? Amen? You got to trust in God. When you're ministering to people, don't come to a place where you we can write off people. Don't write off people. Give them time because God can work in their lives. And when we look at Apostle Paul, he did great miracles. He went to Athens, he went to Galatia, he went to Ephesus, in Rome. Everywhere he went, his ministry was backed with signs, wonders, and miracles. Why do you think we are talking about it now, thousands of years later? Why are we talking about the church in Rome? One church in Colossae, one small church that is, it's one small town. Why are we talking about it? Because these are works that God is testifying. It was all born out of the Spirit. Something that is born of the Spirit will last. Something is born of the flesh. It's going to die away. What's the proof? In the scriptures, remember there was a guy, uh, I think it's um, in the book of Acts, one guy, he came and said, okay, you know, he started a new doctrine. And there were many new doctrines started, but they didn't last. What did the high priest say when they caught Jesus? They said, the high priest said, see, many people have come and said they are the Messiah and all. If it's not, if he's not the Messiah, it'll fade away. Leave him alone. So that which is born of the Spirit will birth the Spirit's work, right? We must minister with compassion and also with power. Let's read 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. I like that first part of the verse. The love of Christ compels us. Some of the versions says the love of Christ constraineth me. Right? What I'm doing, Paul is trying to tell the believers here in, in Corinth, what I'm doing is because of the love of Christ that compels me to do it. Do you think it's fun to go through place to place being beaten up? People are trying to kill me. People are, uh, I don't have proper food. I don't have proper clothing. Do you think it's fun? He's saying, no. He's saying, the love of Christ compels me. Now, the background of this is in Corinth. We've, most of us have read the letter of Corinth, Corinthians, right? What's happening there? The believers are saying, hey, I like Paul, I like Apollos, I like 
Cephas. I like Jesus. So now there's division. So Paul is saying, hello, listen. It's not about Paul. It's not about Apollos. It's not about Cephas. What is this division? The reason all three of us or all of us are doing ministry is because the love of Christ compels us to do it. We could have been sitting in our home and relaxing and doing whatever we want to do, but we've come here because the love of Christ for each one of you is compelling us. It pushes us forward to do the work of the ministry. Right? Let's read. First Thessalonians chapter 2, just a little long verse, 1 to 8. First Thessalonians 2, 1 to 8. As we know, we are bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much comfort. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in his seat. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time will we use flattering words, as you know, nor in hope of covetousness, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, neither from you or from others, when we might have made advances of Jesus Christ. For we were gentle among you, just as a mercy mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had to us. All right, thank you. The church in Thessalonica was a church which had very little, right? It is a small town, but this is the church where Paul is writing and saying, Whatever you, this was the church that blessed Paul materially when he was doing ministry. And he's saying to them that you, whatever you're doing, is you're doing it for the ministry because we did not come to you in our own words, in our own thoughts, in our own abilities, but we came to you in love. And because of love, and because of the love of Christ, that is why you are reciprocating that love through us by your generosity. You know, the love of God is, a, is stronger than the hate that we see in the world. Right? The love of God is stronger than the hate we see in the world. We look around, is there's so much of hatred, jealousy, angers, anger, and there's so much that the enemy is doing. The love of God is able to break through all of that. Right? So Jesus, as Christ, he set an example to us as the Messiah. As our God, he set an example. When we are ministering to people, minister out of power and authority, but let the foundation be love. Right? Let the foundation be love. And build on that foundation. Amen? So let's keep this in our heart, right? Whatever we're doing. The power of God, the authority and power of God, and two, the love of Christ. Shall we pray? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful time. We thank you for what you have taught us today, Lord. I pray that you will teach us, you will lead us and guide us, O oh God, as your children, that we will continue in the things of God. And everything that we do, we will glorify your name and give you praise in our life, O oh God. May our lives be pleasing in your sight. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And God bless you all. Thank you, everyone online. Have a great week ahead. See you next week.